Television's automotive magazine. On this week's program, road tests of the Chevrolet Citation and the Ford Fairmont. From our motor shop, a step-by-step -step guide to oil and filter changes. And as every week, a look into the future with what's new on wheels. Welcome to Motor Week. I'm your host, John Davis, and I'm glad to have you with us. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll have the latest in automotive news and information for you as we try to make your daily life with a family car a more enjoyable one. Our chief mechanic, Craig Singhaas, will be along shortly, and he'll show you one type of car maintenance that you can do yourself and save a few bucks in the process. But before we go too far, let's take a look at the automotive news that made this motor week. Evidence is growing that a new era of goodwill is developing between Washington and the domestic auto industry as the administration strives to help Detroit play catch up with the fuel efficient imports. Indications are that several costly safety and emission requirements for 1983 and beyond might be delayed so that scarce investment capital can be channeled into making higher mileage cars. Prime candidates for the scrap heap include rules that would require all bumpers to withstand an impact of five miles per hour without damaging the car's exterior. And the most controversial regulation of all, airbags. But such action will do nothing to help the current slump in sales and the over one million workers laid off in the auto and related industries. Sales of U.S. made cars were 20% lower in August than one year ago. Meanwhile, imports posted another record sales month and took a 30% share of the U.S. market for the first time. Domestic car sales were slightly higher than the depression levels of early summer. That gave hope that the worst of the decline might be over. Cheaper car loans were believed to be responsible for this slight move to the upside. But for you buyers who can find that easier credit or have cash in hand, the picture is even brighter. With the prospects that 25% of all new car dealers will go out of business this year, those remaining are selling harder than ever. This means that better than average deals can be made on some of the new and most fuel efficient models. Cars currently in unusually large supply include the Chrysler-made Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon, with a large three-month inventory on dealers' lots. Ford is seeing the previously fast-selling Fairmont and Mercury Zephyr shift into low with a slow-going 85-day supply. The Mustang and Capri are somewhat less overstocked with a 70-day supply. And even the much-heralded General Motors X-Body car line, like this Pontiac Phoenix, are available in healthy numbers with a 50-day supply at dealer level. A 60-day new car supply is considered normal by most dealers. Needless to say, most other larger models are in better than average supply, while the more thrifty imports are harder and more expensive to come by. One exception might be Datsun. They're heavily stocked with their 810 and sporty 280ZX models. So if you're in the market for a new car, it might do you good to look for the best deal when times are slow, like right now. Two of these widely available models, the Chevrolet Citation and the Ford Fairmont, are the subjects of this week's road test. These cars represent Detroit's latest thinking on the future of the family sedan. By 1985, the Citation Fairmont class car will be the largest model made in America. We've prepared a summary of those tests to let you judge if either of these domestic products might suit your family's transportation needs. The Ford Fairmont first went on sale in September of 1978 and was viewed by the motoring press as the most advanced sedan ever built by Detroit. The Fairmont and its sister, the Mercury Zephyr, although of conventional front-engine rear-drive construction, featured advanced use of lightweight materials, spacious interiors, and suspensions and steering gear normally found only on imports. First-year Fairmont sales totaled over 422,000 units, an all-time record for a single model. However, in the spring of 1979, Chevrolet unveiled its answer to the Fairmont, and to many experts made the Ford product instantly obsolete. Its much-reviewed X-bodies, with the Chevrolet Citation, the sales leader, took the public by storm. 
The car offered the exterior size of a compact with the interior space of an intermediate car, along with the extra traction provided by its front-wheel drive engine. Both cars have a similar wheelbase of 105 inches. However, the front-wheel drive arrangement on the Citation makes that car almost 19 inches shorter than the Fairmont. The Citation's overall length is 177 inches, but the Fairmont stretches to almost 196 inches. Both cars tested here are four-door sedans, with the Citation having a hatchback and the Fairmont a traditional trunk. Looking under the hood of both cars gives a dramatic view of two different technologies. The Fairmont boasts an inline six-cylinder 3.3-liter engine connected to a three-speed automatic transmission. Accessibility is above average since the Fairmont's engine bay is large enough for eight-cylinder power plants. The Citation is another story. The 2.8-liter V6 in a crossways or transverse arrangement with a three-speed automatic transaxle underneath totally fills its compartment. As for the passengers, both cars have wide front doors for easy entry. However, the Fairmont is kinder for those who must enter the rear. The extra width of the Fairmont is well used for wider seats. Thus, both cars have a maximum capacity of five adults in slightly cramped comfort. Rear visibility in the Fairmont was excellent. The Citation, however, had noticeable blind spots and limited rear visibility. The Citation really is almost a station wagon in this body style. The hatchback has a normal capacity of almost 20 cubic feet of cargo. But when you lower the Citation's rear seats, the volume is doubled. The Fairmont offers a very respectable cargo volume of 16.8 cubic feet and a long, if shallow, floor. Part of our road test includes judging the difficulty of changing a flat tire on the open road without assistance. The Fairmont uses a full-size spare and a scissors jack. The jack lifts the car easily, although the gearing is slow and time-consuming. Once off the ground, a combination lug wrench and jack handle is also used to remove the wheel cover and tire. Putting the flat back into the trunk takes some muscle due to the high rear sill. It will, however, store neatly below the cargo floor. The Citation uses a small, space-saving, temporary spare tire and a conventional bumper jack. This jack is faster but trickier to use than the Fairmont's. There were no problems in changing the Citation's tire, and the flat will also store beneath the cargo floor. In normal driving, each car exhibits a fair amount of road feel through the power steering. In the case of the Citation, with its front drive, the road feel is accentuated, which most drivers will appreciate. GM engineers have done a good job of hiding torque steer, or the tendency of a front-wheel drive car to pull to one side during acceleration. Our Fairmont held a good straight-ahead attitude, but felt very light in the rear during quartering tests. The Citation, despite its lack of weight in the rear, exhibited less of a tendency to fishtail. Handling on both cars benefited from their steel-belted radials, although most drivers found the standard Goodyear and Firestone tires a bit soft and noisy. The Citation had more positive handling, meaning that the minimum steering input would change directions. The Citation has a turning radius of 38 and a half feet. Surprisingly, the Fairmont, despite its bigger size, had almost the same turning radius of 39 feet. Passing acceleration favored the Citation despite the larger size of the Fairmont engine. The Citation moved from 40 to 55 in 4.5 seconds. The Fairmont, due probably to its higher weight, took 5.5 seconds for the same test. Acceleration in both cars was judged as adequate. Braking was perhaps better than expected on both cars. Neither showed noticeable fade in stops from 30 and 55 miles per hour. The GM product stopped in under 30 feet from 30 miles per hour. The Fairmont took almost 45 feet. From 55, the results were much closer, 155 feet for the Citation, 156 for the Fairmont. As we said, the Citation and Fairmont are both part of the newer breed of fuel-efficient family cars. The Environmental Protection Agency rates both six-cylinder cars at 20 miles per gallon city. 
Highway estimates are 27 in the Citation and 30 in the Fairmont. Combined mileage estimates are 23 and 24, respectively. On our 66-mile test loop, the Citation was the thriftiest, averaging 23.5 miles per gallon, and the Fairmont 22 even. Both cars carry a 14-gallon fuel tank. We discovered no glaring faults on either car except for the poor placement of the front seat belts in the Citation. The belts protrude through the front seat cushions in a cheap looking manner and all drivers found the belt shoulder placement uncomfortable. The Fairmont with a similar system was adequate. In summary, the Fairmont is bigger outside without much real advantage on the interior. Both cars are lighter than the models they replaced, but with a full tank of gas, the Citation at 2,780 pounds was 290 pounds lighter than the heavily optioned Fairmont. All in all, these two cars represent the best to date from Detroit and two different routes on technology. The Fairmont is easily the last of its breed as all the automakers shift towards front wheel drive. Both cars will do their job of carrying a family of four or five in reasonable comfort. The Citation can carry far more cargo when needed, and does have a slight edge in gas mileage. One more point. The basic Fairmont four-door costs $5,011. That's compared to a Citation four-door hatchback sticker of $5,734. That $700 advantage for the Fairmont will remain as options are added, since most are similarly priced. That advantage should also increase on 1981 models since GM is expected to lift citation prices some 8% while Fairmont will jump slightly less. That's something to consider in any new car purchase. Now, if you're thinking of buying a new car, chances are that you'll be paying more attention to the gas mileage ratings on the vehicles than ever before. But you've also probably heard that most cars don't get the MPGs that's advertised. What's the truth? Well, every car is tested for mileage by the Environmental Protection Agency as an offshoot of required exhaust admission tests. Cars are prepared by the manufacturers and sent to the EPA months before production begins. Thus, the cars tested are often hand-built prototypes. The EPA tests all cars under the same conditions. That means that since real-life road and weather conditions vary, that all tests must be done in a laboratory with the effects of wind resistance and normal driving programmed into their test equipment. The results are a uniform set of numbers that should be used as comparisons between models rather than a guarantee of expected mileage on any one individual car. There are actually three mileage estimates made by the EPA, a city estimate, a mileage number for sustained highway driving, and a combined figure. The city estimate must be displayed on every new car. It's most often found on the window price sticker. The EPA used to publish all three mileage estimates. However, in real life, few drivers were getting those higher numbers. So bowing to public pressure, the government now only releases the city estimates. Manufacturers are free to release the others if they so wish. Most often, you'll see the highway estimates appearing in advertisements, such as this one. Note that the highway number is displayed without a box. The government says that the city figure must always be the most noticeable. The combined city highway estimate is rarely seen by the public. It's equal to the sum of 55% of the city figure and 45% of the highway estimate. It is this figure that is used to measure how well the automakers are doing in meeting their corporate average fuel economy goals, or CAFE. Federal law says that by 1985, the average fuel economy for all cars made by any one manufacturer must be 27.5 miles per gallon. That figure was 20 MPG in 1980 and will be 22 for 1981. Beyond that, it accelerates to 24 MPG in 1982, 26 in 83, up to 27 in 84, and 27.5 and by mid-decade. There is no single source for all the estimates, and this is now becoming quite a problem for buyers. More and more cars are being built with overdrive transmissions and aerodynamic bodies that significantly improve highway mileage. Thus, new car consumers really need all the estimates to make an intelligent comparison between different makes. The EPA does provide all dealers with copies of the City Gas Mileage Guide, which lists all car models sold in the U.S. When you ask your dealer for one, also ask him for the highway and combined estimates for the cars you're interested in. That way you can do the comparisons yourself. And in a future program, we'll be going to the EPA laboratory to give you a first-hand look at how the mileage tests are made. 
By the way, when you're buying that new car, you might want to make sure that it has still belted radial tires on it. Tests show that radials can mean from one half to one full mile per gallon gain over more conventional bias or glass belted tires. The average cost of steel belted radials as an option on new cars is only about $60. And chances are that you'll more than recoup that cost and lower fuel consumption over the life of the tires. I'm here with our chief mechanic for Motor Week, Craig Singhaas, and tonight we're going to show you how to do the most basic of all automotive maintenance, that's changing your motor oil and filter. Craig, most manufacturers recommend that you go 7,500 miles, or about six months, between oil and filter changes. Is that sufficient? Well, John, it really depends on your driving habits. You see, urban stop-and-go driving is harder on motor oil than highway miles. Also, if you do a lot of short trips, the oil doesn't heat up enough to dissipate the acids which build up in the oil. So I would recommend to city drivers that they change their oil more often, say about every 5,000 miles for a new car, maybe more frequently for an older car. So do you always change your oil filter every time you change your oil? Yeah, you sure should. You see, the oil filter traps foreign particles in the oil, and not changing your oil filter is like dumping a quart of dirty oil back into your crankcase. Well, how do you know which oil and filter to use? Well, it's really very simple. First, you consult your owner's manual and find out what size engine you have. And then you match that information up with the information provided on the back of the oil filter box. Now, as for the oil, I'd recommend for most new cars a multi-grade 10W40 weight. Now, that's except for the diesels because the diesels require a special grade oil. Fine. Well, for the beginner, what are the basic tools that's, that's needed? Well, really very few. Um, you'd start out with an adjustable wrench or a box end wrench like this an oil filter wrench. You know, you need a catch pan also. Now, I use an old baby bath, uh, an oil filter spout, or an old can opener, mm -hmm. and some rags. Uh, also, it's real nice to have uh, an old blanket to lay underneath the car and some uh, newspapers to catch up any spills. Tell us now how to get started. What's the first step? Okay, it's really very simple. The first thing we do is we jack the car up. Now, a lot of cars, it's, they're high enough so that you can change the oil without mm -hmm. jacking the car. But if not, if you have to jack, the important thing to remember is safety. Now, you want to jack the car up with a, a scissors jack or a hydraulic jack. But then you want to put the car on jack stands or ramps. You never want to crawl under a car that's not su supported by uh, jack stands or ramps. Um, then the next thing to do would be, if it's an automatic transmission car, you want to put the car up in park. You want to chock the rear wheels and pull on the parking brake. Well, obviously, it's safety first. Now, let's take a look at an actual oil and filter change and let Craig give you the step-by-step -step instructions as we go along. For our demonstration, we've taken this car to a local garage so that the camera can get a good view of how to change the oil and filter. First, make sure the engine's oil is warm so that it will drain properly. Most filters are located on the side or bottom of the engine. It's probably a good practice to make sure you can reach the filter with an oil wrench before starting. It would be costly and messy to drain the oil, only find you can't remove the filter. Now, locate the oil drain port. It's usually located on one side of the oil pan at the bottommost part of the engine. Using a box or an adjustable wrench, slowly remove the plug. When it is loose, unscrew it by hand while keeping an inward pressure on the plug. Now this will keep oil from seeping out and running down your hand. Now, when it's loose, pull it away and let the oil fall into a pan. Now be careful, the oil's hot around 150 degrees and you'll probably get some oil on you so don't wear clothes that you love. Now, if you drop the plug into the oil, don't worry. Just fish it out after the old oil is cooled and clean it before reinstalling it. After the oil is drained to a trickle, screw the plug back in by hand. Then, use the wrench to tighten it to just snug. Now, you've got to be very careful not to over-tighten the plug since it could strip the oil pan threads and cause a leak. 
Now, if you have time, let the motor cool. Now move the catch pan under the filter. With your oil wrench, unscrew the filter in a counterclockwise motion. Finish the job by hand and allow the oil inside the filter to drop into your catch pan. Now be sure to remove the old rubber gasket. Throw the filter away. Uh, again, now this can get messy as the filter has about a quart of dirty oil in it. Take the new filter and with your finger, spread a small amount of fresh oil around the rubber seal. Now install the new filter clockwise by hand until the rubber gasket just makes contact with the engine block. Then tighten three quarters of a turn further, again by hand if possible. Now it's time to refill the crankcase. Take your oil filter nozzle and place it into one can at a time. Turn the can upside down into the crankcase filler hole. Now this is usually on the valve cover of the engine. Allow the can to drain completely. Then repeat the process until all the cans are drained. Now be careful to wipe off any oil spill around the engine before restarting the car. Now once this is done, look underneath for leaks. If there are none, start the car for about 15 seconds just to get the new oil circulating. Stop the car and again check for leaks. Now if you see more than a drop of oil around the drain plug, tighten it slightly. You should see no leaks at all around the filter. If you do, tighten it some more. Now, take your owner's manual, and in the back you'll find a place to record oil change information. Mark the type of oil used, and the miles on the odometer, and the date. Now this will prevent you from guessing how long it's been between oil changes. Further, it could be very important information if the car is under warranty and any engine problems develop. Now that you've finished the job, what do you do with the old oil? Well, what you don't do is pour it out in your yard or throw it away with the garbage. You see, contrary to popular belief, oil doesn't wear out, it just gets dirtier. Recycling motor oil has become a big business in the United States and a major conservation measure. The best advice is to find a local service station that will take your old oil. Some 14 states, including Maryland, have highly organized programs for recycling and member stations display signs such as this. The station then sells the oil to a re-refiner, which will make the oil into other industrial petroleum products. Craig, that was a good demonstration, but I've got a question. At the end of that piece, you show the oil in a one-gallon container. Now, when I try to do that at home, even with a funnel, I get oil all over the place. Now, there's got to be a trick up your sleeve about how to get it into the bottle without making a mess. What is it? Well, it's really very simple. Take an old bleach bottle, mm -hmm. and the cap slips down inside the milk bottle, oh, I see. making a nice tight seal, and there's no spill. That's very clever. Thanks, Craig. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Much of what Craig dealt with tonight focused on how to work on your car safely. And the matter of automotive safety is a big issue. So every week we're going to bring you up to date on pertinent automotive recall information and other safety advice. On that note, this week the Federal Trade Commission formally charged General Motors of equipping over four million cars with automatic transmissions too small to carry the load. In question is the Type 200 transmission, like this one right here. The FTC claims that repairs could cost consumers some $50 million, and transmissions have been reported as failing within as few as 15,000 miles. In its defense, GM says that there are many different versions of the transmission with many different components, each strengthened to carry the loads of various engines and car sizes. Further, it should be noted that the FTC and the Center for Auto Safety have received only 2,000 complaints on the transmission. Yet GM has sold over 4 million cars equipped with the unit, and that's despite vigorous publicity by the FTC for several months. 
The complaint rate is thus still far less than 1% of the owners involved. Now, whether GM can successfully defend its position or will be forced to warn owners of potential problems they don't feel exist will probably take many months in the court. But if you're wondering if you have this transmission on your car, look for the word metric on the bottom cover plate. If it's there, your car has some variation of the transmission in question. On what's new on wheels tonight, we have a few treats for you. A first look at some of the new models that'll be rolling into your showroom in the near future. Many of you know that this month Ford is going to unveil its long-awaited replacement for the much-criticized Pinto. The new car seen here, the Ford Escort and Mercury Lynx, will be Ford's first domestically made front-wheel drive car. It'll be small and reportedly have outstanding gas mileage of 30 MPG City and 44 Highway. This will also be Ford's first world car, meaning the basic car will be made in many different lands. Not so well known is that Ford will be offering a sporty version of the car next spring. And here is what it'll look like. It'll be called the Ford EXP or Mercury LN7. The car will feature an almost grillless front end with some versions having slots in the hood to let cooling air escape. The cars will come in a coupe and a hatchback version and this sporty coupe will offer the same high gas mileage as the boxier Escort, but at a considerable price increase. Both cars will have four-cylinder engines with a variety of transmissions. Over at General Motors, they're putting the final touches on their world car, the J car, a slightly smaller version of the X car. This car is designed to replace the Chevrolet Monza and Pontiac Sunbird. The models are somewhat boxy in appearance and are made to fill the gap between the Chevrolet Chevette and the Citation. But GM is also planning to market two even smaller front-wheel drive cars in the next few years. One is rumored to be a two-seater, like this experimental model. It'll offer either a gasoline, electric, or a combination of the two for power. The Chrysler Corporation is trying hard to figure out how it's going to follow its new K cars that are coming out this fall. Many pictures have already been published of the Dodge Aries and Plymouth Reliant, but so far there's been no official word on the sports coupe or sports car that may accompany the new models within a year. Bringing out a sporty version of new small cars is one way that the automakers hope to make big profits on small cars for the first time. Not to be outdone, the Japanese are continuing their assaults on the U.S. markets with a revised version of the Mazda GLC. This car will switch from front engine, rear drive, to front wheel drive. Thus, we have yet another Econo box. Honda, which has yet to market an unsuccessful car since the Civic, is readying the Honda Quint. This five-door hatchback will use the floor pan of the sporty Prelude and fit between the Civic and Accord models. And even the French are getting into the act. As Renault lengthens its ties with American Motors and begins sales of a U.S. version of the Renault 18 sedan this month. This four-passenger front-wheel drive car will give AMC the fuel-efficient sedan it so badly needs. A made-in-USA version of this car is due off the Kenosha, Wisconsin assembly line by 1982. And a sporty model named the Fuego is scheduled to also arrive in 1982. The car is already on sale in France and is considered one of the best-looking Renaults in many years. Renault is banking on its ties with American Motors to once and for all end the bad reputation it made during the 1960s when Dauphines and Caravelles were sold and soured upon so widely. So that's a look at things to come. Now, many of the pictures and drawings we show you each week on Motor Week come from information and photos supplied by you viewers. So if you think you have something on what's coming in a new car, drop us a line at MotorWeek, Box 85, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's MotorWeek, Box 85, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Who knows, that strange looking four-wheeler in your last snapshot could be what we'll all be driving tomorrow. And with that, we'll end our show with a few words on things to come next week on MotorWeek. We'll be going into an auto showroom to give you some advice on how to deal with that new car salesman and how you should handle yourself in trying for the best deal. Craig Singhouse will be back with a look at under the hood filter changes that you can do yourself. And I'll give you another peek into new cars from Detroit and Tokyo. See you next week.
For a transcript of tonight's program, send $2 to Motor Week, Box 85, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Motor Week, Box 85, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Residents of Maryland include 10 cents sales tax. Ask for program number 101.